Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, my name is uh, Wolfgang Buttress, and as, uh, as Marcus said, I'm an artist uh, based in a, live in Nottingham in, in England. And uh, yeah, it's very exciting to be here. The last year has been, uh, it's been an amazing year. It's probably been one of the best and probably one of the hardest years of my life in a lot of ways. And what I thought I'd do this evening is talk a, a little bit about myself as an artist. I'll show you a, a couple of uh, previous works as precedents to maybe give you a little flavor of uh, uh, how I approach my, my practice. Uh, then I'll talk a bit about uh, the ideas of the, of the pavilion itself. And then there's some animations, uh, some videos, some photographs. Uh, and then at the end, what would be really good if we could maybe have a, a conversation and we can talk. You might have some uh, questions about the philosophy, about uh, the build, about the fabrication, about some of the challenges that I've had. Uh, and I often sort of find once you get into a conversation, more things can kind of come out. It might be more interesting. So I'll try and keep it down to about half an hour. And uh, we'll, yeah, I look forward to having a chat at the end. Uh, I'm going to show you three uh, sculptures. This uh, first sculpture is a sculpture called Rise. And it's, uh, it's in the centre of Belfast. And for those of you who don't know, uh, uh, Northern Ireland, uh, even though it's part of uh, Great Britain, has had a troubled history uh, for, uh, for many years. And this sort of sculpture uh, sits in uh, the middle of, of what was two warring factions. You had the Catholics on one side and you had the Protestants uh, on the other sort of side. Uh, and it was two ghettos in a way. And we had, uh, we had this motorway which runs in, in, in between the, in these two communities. The, uh, uh, the Irish government wanted a, a, a sort of sculpture uh, to be in the middle of, it, of this community. And it was a... Uh, it was a real challenge. It was a very deprived area in, in Belfast. Uh, when I first went there, a lot of the places uh, had outside toilets, uh, and people were saying, what are you doing spending a substantial amount of money on, on a sort of sculpture? Uh, there was a lot of scepticism. Uh, I knew the, the area quite well, uh, and one of the things which I was very keen to do as I doing a lot of my work, my, my work is, is site specific and it's about the space, it's about the history and the traces of, of the area. And what I wanted to do in, in, with this sort of piece was I wanted it to be the same, look the same from both sides, from the east or the west, when you kind of come into Belfast and when you kind of come out of Belfast. The idea itself came from where I live in Nottingham, it's a similar landscape, it's, uh, uh, it's by the river and there's a lot of marshes and reeds Originally, uh, in this area in Belfast, there was a, uh, marshes and boglands. And I saw one day walking my greyhounds, uh, this sun rising. It was a beautiful summer's morning. The sun was rising. It's about four or five in the morning. And you could see the sun and the moon and the sky at the, sa at the same time rising over these reeds. And I thought as a symbol for, for Belfast, it could be a really nice something. It, it symbolizes the sun. Uh, it's symmetrical. It looks the same from both sides. Uh, this is a, a sculpture which was installed. It's, it's a lot smaller. This is only about a meter, cu a meter cubed in, a, in Tokyo. And I put this on because there are, there are a few ideas, similar ideas, which I've taken from and, and uh, applied to, to the pavilion. Uh, I'm interested in, in the, the idea of kind of creating sort of spaces and sort of sculptures like using the, the minimal amount of, uh, of materials. And an obvious thing to say, but a very important thing to say, that one of the differences between sculpture and, and a painting, that it looks different from, it's, it, it exists in the round. As you walk around it, you have a different relationship with it. This is actually looking at the sort of sculpture from, uh, from different angles. Uh, when you get very close to it, you can sort of see the shape of a sort of sun. When you walk away from it, it almost disappears. The actual lines that you see in the sculpture itself are words and meditations uh, of automatic writing about, about the sun. Uh, this was sort of done with people in my own studio and my studio over in, uh, in Japan. So again, it was this uh, combination of two cultures uh, coming together. This is a project which I did a couple of years ago in, in Australia at the Australian National University, 
works with some amazing architects <coughs> called uh, Lyons, uh, and they wanted a, uh, a sculpture uh, to go in the new science wing uh, uh, in the university. There was no brief. I just had to, re to respond to the site and, and the space. Uh, I met a really amazing astrophysicist called Dr. Daniel Bayliss, and I thought it would be really lovely to try and work out some, some of the ideas which I've always been interested in space and, and astrophysics. And one of the things I was very keen to do, that this sort of sculpture would reflect the, uh, the natural environment. So it's a four metre diameter uh, mirror polished stainless steel sphere. And what you can see on the outside of it, there's 9,100 perforations. And each one of those perforations uh, maps all of the stars that you can see with your naked eye from Earth. So you want, when one goes up to it, there's a little animation you can see here. Uh, you see it from afar. You, you see how uh, the, it, it captures the different light, the different sort of change in seasons uh, in Canberra. It reflects the architecture. And what I wanted to do again was to create the synthesis between art, architecture, and science. And when one looks inside one of the perforations inside, there's another two meter diameter polished stainless steel sphere, which acts almost as like a microcosm of the universe that, that we can see. Uh, so from the outside, you have no sense that this is in until you kind of get very close. So you have a real intimate relationship with, uh, with the sort of sculpture. Then at night time, uh, what happens? In the inner sphere, there's a set within, within the ball itself, uh, there's some LED lights which you can't see, and they emanate light. So at night time, the actual uh, map of the sky is mapped on the outside of the sphere, and uh, on, in the daytime, one can see in it. It was, a, again, a great collaboration between science and, uh, and architecture. I learned so much. One of the things when I was a child, I was never great particularly at, at sort of science or maths. My, I was always into kind of art and painting and English. And I always used to see that uh, the sciences and engineering was kind of over there and art was kind of over here. And what I've come to realize over the years is that we have similar searches. We have similar kind of criteria. We're both looking for form, we're looking for meaning and some kind of sort of sense in, in our existence. So what I'm going to talk to you now is about the, uh, some the first ideas about the UK pavilion. Uh, as, far, as far as I'm aware, I'm the first artist for the UK to actually kind of design a pavilion uh, for the expert. It uh, has an amazing heritage, obviously going back right back to the Eiffel Tower, uh, to Paxton's uh, Crystal Palace, to Buckminster's Fuller, uh, Montreal, uh, uh, Biosphere. And when the, the competition was first announced, I was very reticent about applying. I thought there'd be so many architects, engineers applying for this, this thing. Uh, and I thought, oh, it'd just be too crazy. It's too much of a one-off to even, even to think about it. I'd never be successful. And then there was one evening I was talking with my wife, and she was saying, oh, what, you know, what would you do if you had the chance to do this? You know, if you just dream, what would you actually do? And I thought about, because cause the theme itself is feeding the planet, it's a very laudable aim, but, but within that I think there are contradictions, there are ironies and there are sort of challenges that so many pavilions spend so much kind of money uh, on this six months expo. So to me, if I was going to do something, it had to be relevant, it had to have integrity. So the first idea, in a way, was almost to take a section of the UK landscape over to, over to Milan. And one of the things which I've been reading a lot about over the last few years, which uh, I'm sure you're all aware of, is, is, is the plight of the honeybee and how important it is in terms of pollination. Uh, pollinators are responsible for 30% of all the food uh, that we eat. Uh, and the honeybee is a, is a major player in this. And it's under serious pressure because of lack of biodiversity, monoculture, pesticides. Uh, and a really horrible little mite called the Valroa. Uh, so I was thinking what would, what would be 
a kind of great thing to do was almost to, to sort of see the pavilion as an experience to kind of use instead of having a piece of architecture which sits in a landscape to actually have an immersive experience of the, of the whole of the, the landscape itself and to use uh, the idea and the metaphor of the bee and what I wanted to do was instead of uh, to, to lecturing people about, about these sort of things, about the bee, about the sort of plight of the bee, is for people to actually feel it. What we've done, and been working with some amazing architects, BDP, uh, Tristan Simmons, uh, this incredible engineer who's worked with some of the most, the, the greatest artists currently working today, like Anish Kapoor and Anthony Gormley. And what we came up with was, was, was a journey and it starts off uh, in a British orchard. Uh, the whole of the landscape takes the form of the waggle dance, which is, which is uh, uh, how the bee communicates within the hive. And what I'll do now is uh, show you a short uh, video animation of a walkthrough and then talk through about, about some of the ideas. The, the plot itself is very long, very uh, quite narrow. It's 100 metres by 20, minutes, uh, 20 metres wide. And so to me, the, the idea that it could be a journey, it could be a walk. So at the, at the front of the, the space there, you can see the orchard, then we have the meadow, and then the hive. So I'll play this little walkthrough, which is about a couple of minutes, and then I'll start talking to you a little bit about how we actually uh, uh, realised it. So you can imagine yourself now almost as a bee going through this UK meadow. You see the hive sort of structure above you. You see people walking inside of it almost in silhouette, almost like bees would be uh, in a real hive. And it's this idea of playing on the micro and the macro that somehow you have a sense of, uh, of empathising and being a bee itself. What we have this is the main sort of terrace. And now you're actually inside the hive itself. What you're hearing now is uh, the real sounds of uh, bees, which are coming from a real beehive uh, back, back in Nottingham. We put these things called accelerometers, which actually measure the energy and the vibrations of a hive and this gets sent digitally uh, and is expressed to sound into the pavilion. It also generates and activates the LED lights. So in the morning, say for example, when the, the beehive is very quiet and very calm, uh, the lights and the sound are very calm, very quiet, very meditative. In the afternoon when, when the bees uh, are searching for the pollen, the nectar, there's more energy, there's more activity. So you have this real sense that you're actually in the beehive, you're actually w one with the bee itself. One of the things, again, is, is really important ab about the whole of the, of the pavilion, which uh, I shall come back to in a minute, is the whole idea of uh, food and, and biodiversity. So right at the beginning of the, of the project, so I pulled together a, a team, and one of the members of the team was, uh, was sort of Slow Food UK, who, who championed forgotten food, slow food as a way of eating. Uh, 
working with uh, internationally renowned sort of chef Anton Mosserman, who was the first Michelin sort of chef, uh, Michelin star chef uh, in the UK. He's creating the, the, the main sort of foods in, in our pavilion, working with uh, some other great sort of chefs over the six month period, people like sort of Tom Aikens and An Angela Hartner. And again, the provenance of the food is, is simple. It's from the UK, it's sourced locally. And again, this t ties into the idea of sort of, uh, of thinking, thinking globally. One of the, the, the greatest pleasures of working on, on, on this project is working with uh, this fellow here on the right, Dr. Martin Benchik from uh, Nottingham Trent University. He's a, a complete force of nature and he's been my kind of main collaborator right through the sort of project. He's told me so much about the bees, how bees are, how, what bees do, how important they are. This is my first time when I actually opened up a, a beehive. When I first opened up a beehive, I'd, I imagined it would be kind of scary, intimidating, a bit kind of like this. But in, a, in effect, that it's incredibly calm, it's incredibly mesmerizing. The sound, you have this, this, this hum, this kind of uh, deep kind of resonance, which is incredibly beautiful, incredibly kind of reassuring. And so instead of sort of feeling kind of scared of the bees, it made me sort of feel kind of not at one with them, but a real sort of sympathy. There was a real energy, a real kind of focus. And working with Martin, this is how we sort of thought, how can we actually express this energy, this vibrancy, this potency, this, uh, this sense of life within the, the hive itself? So what we've got, as I briefly mentioned before, we have these accelerometers in the hive in, a, in the UK. Uh, and accelerometers, they express the, the vibrations and the energy of the real hive which then goes into the sculptural hive and translates that as sound and, and music. As, as in all the projects that I worked on, everything kind of starts with, with a, a sort of simple sort of sketches. I make small maquettes, small ideas. Uh, I have hundreds of notebooks and they're really sort of quick. Some of the sketches are, are better than others, but it's a, for me it's a really great way of kind of getting something down. A lot of my Sculptures are, are very simple, but how they become so simple is, is a process of elimination, a process of, of kind of reduction. And to get to where, where I want these things to be, I work with some amazing structural engineers. This is a, will be maybe a couple of minutes, I'll talk a little bit about how we actually made uh, the hive in terms of the drawings, about the actual rationale behind it. And then I'll go on and sort of show you some photographs about how we're actually kind of building the, the piece together. So the hive itself sort of started off as a cube. And what I wanted to use was uh, all of the space which is available to us within, within the pavilion. So it's a 14 metre by 14 metre cube on three metre legs. So it stands 17 metres, which is the maximum uh, we could actually go in the pavilion. And what I wanted to do with that, even though I wanted to have a presence, I wanted it to be as delicate and ethereal and as ephemeral as possible. So even though it would have a presence, I didn't want it to be bombastic. And picking up on some of the ideas which I worked on with the space uh, sculpture in Japan, had this idea of kind of layers. So when you see the sculpture from afar, it kind of disappears with these horizontal lines. And as one approaches it and gets closer to it, it reveals itself into something else. This is the, uh, the sculpture in plan. And then this is uh, the sort of sculpture. There's 32 layers which make up the 14 metres. What I wanted to do was, instead of actually looking at a sculpture, you would actually kind of be in the sort of sculpture. So it's this idea of a combination, of, I suppose, of art and architecture. It's a, it's a space within a space. And I was keen that it didn't have kind of walls. It wasn't a closed-in environment, but somehow you'd have a connection with nature, even though you were very much with, uh, within a sort of structure. But I wanted it to be permeable, uh, and I wanted it to be uh, delicate, and I wanted you to be able to dream. This is uh, the size of it. So at the moment, 
we've got a nine metre floor, nine metre diameter floor, we can get about 50 or 60 people within it and then it's populated around the outer ring by a series of uh, by LED lights. And then you can start seeing the layers when you actually kind of move up to it, how it starts to reveal itself, the inner void. Each one of these layers was made up uh, from a very sort of simple lattice hexagon. And again, it was taking the idea from bees. I mean, bees have been making honeycombs for 150 million years. And with only the last 50 or 60 years, we've probably sort of realized how strong the honeycomb is with the triangulation. So, you know, obviously we've, we've got a lot to learn from nature, as, as, I'm, as I'm sure we all realize. This is a looking through the piece uh, with the radial layers. And what I've started, to, what you can start sort of seeing now is how uh, the, with the hexagons actually within the layers themselves, uh, it starts to disappear. The edges start to become blurry. And one starts to sort of see these suggested hexagonal sort of shapes which changes and moves depending on your perspective. This is the hexagonal floor, and then what we did with this was use uh, some uh, uh, CATIA software to actually analyze the sort of structure it's itself to work out that where the structure needed more stress, that the, uh, that the aluminum parts became thicker and more sort of solid, and where they were under less stress, they become more sort of delicate. So we created this sort of spiral. Each one of the, uh, the, uh, each one of the layers was rotated by two degrees and then we cut the cube out of the middle of it. Then we start working on how we can actually sort of join the layers together by using a simple uh, triangulation. The first, and when it all comes together, it becomes like this. It's, it's very difficult to express in renders and models. And what's been so uh, refreshing and lovely is actually sort of seeing how the actual real piece on site now is looking very sort of similar to, the, uh, to, to these original drawings. At first we have these uh, horizontal uh, uh, trusses, these radial cords, uh, we call them, and then we triangulate them by three points. We realised on site it's going to be really difficult to do that, having uh, three pieces together. So we made them into two. This really helps in, in terms of the efficiency. Uh, there's 170,000 different pieces and parts within uh, uh, the sculpture itself. Uh, at first, each one was completely different, uh, and then we rationalized that and refined it for simplicity and for ease of manufacture. This is where we went from the three vertical uh, trusses down to two. The actual sort of forces themselves, it's like a, a cylinder. So the forces kind of come down uh, towards uh, around the ring itself. And then we have a ring beam, which people actually walk and stand upon. Uh, the legs themselves, instead of being sort of straight, they were moved uh, for bracing and to make them more elegant and more integrated with the sculpture itself. These are all the 32 layers. And on top of each other, and this is them actually sort of stacked. This is a section through it. On the top, we have a glass floor. So again, one of the ideas was that you can actually sort of see people walking through and into the sort of sculpture, so people are like sort of silhouettes. The whole piece is incredibly immersive. And then this is the, uh, the original, uh, the dream, the, the original kind of renders. And what I'll show you now is that this was on site maybe three weeks ago to give you a sort of sense about how those original ideas are actually sort of coming into reality.
We've been working with some amazing landscape architects and gardeners and some nurseries here in Milan. Uh, so all the, the grasses, uh, we're working with Kew Gardens back in, in London. We've had to specify the, uh, the plants so it looks fantastic for the whole sort of six months. And uh, what we're doing, we're growing the plants on. So come the 1st of May, there will be a wildflower meadow. So it will be like this section of the UK transported over to Milan. This is actually from the hive looking down into, into, the, into the space itself. And this is the, uh, the piece at night. Uh, Marco uh, just showed me, I haven't even seen this yet, Marco just showed me the, uh, a photograph of the LED lights now, which are finally starting to work. I've seen it at dusk, and it works. It's amazing, so maybe Marco can sort of show us later. I'm actually going to site tomorrow morning. So uh, on the inside, this is very much how it's going to, going to look. These are the... Uh, I'll go through some of the sort of shots now, how we actually kind of made the piece. Uh, this is back in uh, Yorkshire. This is the first uh, test piece of the, the sculpture itself. Uh, there's, it's all mill-finished aluminium. I've chosen to use all the materials themselves to be, uh, to, to be raw, to patinate uh, gracefully. Uh, there's no welding in them, so it means everything can be built together with incredibly uh, tight tolerances. And then so that means the whole sort of thing could be assembled very simply and then also been uh, reassembled when it has its second life back in the UK. These are some of the components of the nodes. These are some of the 1,000 LED lights which are inside the piece. And this is on site underneath the hive itself where we actually kind of created a little factory. And it had to be incredibly precise. We had to build this whole piece in about three months these 170,000 pieces. Each one is stamped and numbered. And this is the beginning of the hive itself. You can see the ring beam, uh, which everything is supported on and through. And you can sort of see now, this is the first layer of the fellows starting to put the piece together. And again, what has been really interesting talked early on about you know, the connection maybe between the bee and, uh, and, and people. When you actually sort of see the, the fellows actually on sort of site there and the kind of the high res uh, yellow sort of jackets, they're almost like kind of bees and their own kind of honeycomb building this, up, this, this piece together. And uh, this is as the piece itself starts to rise from the ground. And it's incredibly strong. Uh, even though it's incredibly fine, the actual rods themselves are thinner than my finger. They're eight mil, so it's incredibly, incredibly delicate, but incredibly strong. And this is coming to make up the oculus. This is from the sort of center of its sort of self. And then this shot here was taken uh, maybe two weeks ago when the scaffolding finally came down. So in the process of, of, of doing this uh, project, we're, uh, we're doing a book and also doing a vinyl, working with these amazing uh, musicians, uh, spiritualized, the violinist from sort of Seagull Ross. And again, what's happening with this, with, with, the, with the soundscape, is that the, the live energy from the bees, from the hive itself, will actually sort of trigger off sort of signals, which will trigger off cellos, It'll trigger off little sort of samples of violins, of uh, recorded choral pieces. So again, there's this real sort of synthesis and synergy between, between bee and man. So this is a time-lapse camera started right at the beginning of the, of, of the, of, of the, of the build back in, a, uh, back in October. And it's about two and a half minutes long and it sort of shows the uh, the developments over it. In a couple of minutes' time, you're going to hear, in a couple of seconds' time, you hear some really incredible sort of sounds, this do, do, do sound. And that's the actual sound of bees communicating, which have never been uh, heard to the general public. So this, this expo uh, will be the first time you'll actually sort of hear how bees have communicated, actually communicate with each other. So what you're starting to see now, I suppose, is, is the grand reveal because we didn't, you never really know what the piece was going to look like until the scaffolding kind of came down, until it almost take it, took its coat off. 
And so when it finally kind of revealed itself, it was a, it was a real thrill. So this is it from the top. You can sort of see the skyline of Milan. This, is, this was taken maybe three or four days ago at the bar at the end. This is the, from the bar looking into it. And this was taken, I think, two days ago, looking into the piece. And I think you can start sort of seeing uh, uh, the lightness and how it's coming. So I'll stop there and maybe what might be quite nice, if you want to maybe ask some questions and we can have a bit of a conversation about maybe some of the challenges that we've gone through, some of the, the philosophy behind it, uh, uh, some, of the, some of the constraints.